Hi there, boys and girls. Welcome to our vodcast on energy transfers in the ecosystem. Now, energy transfers in an ecosystem can be represented in one of three ways. We have food chains, food webs, and energy pyramids. So let's take a look at these three representations. Okay, the first representation we're going to take a look at is called a food chain. Now, what a food chain does is that it shows the energy transfers among specific organisms in an ecosystem. So first and foremost, you need to remember that the sun is the primary source of energy in all ecosystems, in a land ecosystem or an aquatic ecosystem. Without the sun, the producers couldn't make food, and if the producers couldn't make food, everything else would collapse. So what would happen is this. The sun's going to shine its rays down onto the plant, and the plant is going to produce glucose through photosynthesis, as we've been talking about. That glucose is a form of chemical energy that's been created. Now, what will happen is that glucose will get transferred to our herbivore, or our primary consumer, because this herbivore is going to eat the plants. So whatever stored sugar is inside the plant will get transferred into the herbivore. Then what will happen, unfortunately, for the herbivore, it's going to get eaten by another predator, mainly this bear here. So the energy inside of this herbivore is going to get transferred into the bear. So as you can see, a food chain is pretty much a straight line representation of where energy goes from one organism to the next. However, a food web is a little more complex. So what you see here is a food web. And what a food web shows, that's a little different from a food chain, a food web shows the energy transfer between all of the organisms in an ecosystem. So it's showing us not just two or three animals, it's showing every animal and plant in the ecosystem. So let's learn about how to read a food web. The first rule of reading a food web is knowing that the arrows don't show who eats who. If you just take a look at the food web, it'll make perfect sense to you. For example, here you have some berries and flowers. And maybe a bear goes foraging on berries and flowers. If you think the arrow is showing that someone is eating something else, then what you're saying is that the berries and flowers eats the bear. I don't know about you. I've never seen a bear get taken down by a berry bush before. So they don't show who eats who. They do show the flow of energy from the organism being eaten. So for example, the berries and flowers here have energy that then flow into the bear as the bear eats the berries and flowers. So remember that the arrows show the flow of energy from one organism to the next. Now let's take a look at some examples of reading the food web. Some questions that you might be asked is to identify either an herbivore, carnivore, or an omnivore. And that's what you're going to have to do. That's a skill that you need in reading a food web. The key is to remember what does that consumer eat and then start from there. So for example, Let's start with the herbivores. As we know, herbivores eat plants. So we want to focus on the berries and the flowers, the grasses, and the seeds. And as we said in the last slide, the arrows show the flow of energy going from one thing to the next. So to find the herbivores, what you need to do is find where the arrows are flowing from the plants. So for example, we have our seeds here with an arrow flowing from it to the chipmunk. So the energy from the seeds is going into the chipmunk. Now if you take a look, there are no other arrows pointing at the chipmunk here. So its only food source is the seeds. So that makes it an herbivore. So we take a look at the grasses here. We see that there are two arrows flowing from the grasses. We have one going to the insects and one going to the marmot. So we want to just make sure that these consumers have no other arrows going to it from any other food source. So if we take a look at the insects here, Okay, we'll notice that it only has the arrow going from the grass to it. So the energy from the grass is going into the insect. That's its only food source. That makes it an herbivore. The marmot, we take a look at the marmot. There are no other arrows going to the marmot, just the one from the grasses. So the energy from the grass is going to the marmot. That makes it a third herbivore. We do have one more. So let's go over to the berries and the flowers. The flowers and the berries have a bunch of arrows going off of it. One's going to the grouse, one's going to the bear, one's going to the deer. So you have to take a look and see what the other things are eating. So if I have energy going from the berries and flowers to the grouse, let's take a look at what else the grouse is eating. It's got an energy flow from insects, and it's got another energy flow from seeds. The grouse is not an herbivore because it eats both plant matter and animal matter. That makes it an omnivore. And then if we take a look at this arrow going to the bear, we'll notice that there's energy going from the plants to the bear, but we'll also note that there's energy going from the deer to the bear and the chipmunk to the bear. So again, we have another organism that's getting energy from animals and plants. So the bear is an omnivore. So you can scribble one of those two into your omnivore answer blanks. 
let's take a look at this third organism that's got the arrows coming from the berries and the flowers. So the energy is flowing into the deer. If we look at the deer, there are no other arrows pointing at it. So it's getting no energy from any other source. So it's only food source are the berries and the flowers. So our deer is going to be our fourth herbivore. With that, we've knocked out our herbivores and our omnivores, so we just have to take a look at the carnivores. In order to find a carnivore, what you need to do is find an animal in the food web that has an arrow or multiple arrows pointing at it from animals. In our food web here, we have our red-tailed hawk. Energy is flowing from the marmot to the hawk that eats animal material. But we got to double check the other arrows too. Energy is flowing from the chipmunk. It's eating another animal. That makes That's two animals, but we have a third arrow here. As we take a look, this arrow is coming from the grouse, another animal. So the red-tailed hawk has three arrows coming from the animals, which makes it a carnivore. That's how you figure out who the herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores are in a food web. Sometimes what will happen is that you're going to get a question in how the elimination or the presence of one organism will affect the others. So let's take a look at that next. Okay, so here's our food web, and here's two questions that we have. The first question reads, if the bears in this web were overhunted, resulting in no more bears, what would happen to the deer population? So if we got rid of the bears and they were gone, no more bears, what would happen to the deer population? Let's take a look at the deer. As we take a look at the deer, we'll notice that there's an energy flow going from the deer to the bear. And there's no energy flow going anywhere else other than decomposers. And the decomposers, as we said, break down dead things. So while the deer is alive, it doesn't have to worry about being eaten by bears if the bears are gone. So if there are no bears to eat the deer, then what do you think is going to happen? Well, if you said the deer population would increase, you're correct. Because what they'll do is they'll eat food, they'll survive, and have offspring. So the deer population is going to get bigger. Question B here says, then what would happen to the berry and flower population when the bears are gone? At first glance... We see that the berries and the flowers have energy going to the bears, so one might think, well, there are going to be more berries and flowers. There are less bears eating it. Well, remember, bears are omnivores, so they weren't solely eating the berries and flowers. So they're not the main consumer of berries and flowers. The deer are the main consumers of the berries and flowers. If the deer are no longer being eaten by the bear, and there are more deer being born and surviving in the ecosystem, then what do you think is going to happen to the flower and berry population? Well, if you said it's going to decrease, that's correct, because you're going to have a lot of deer eating the berries and flowers, decimating that population of berries and flowers. On your notes, it says you need to find a food chain in this web. So there's a particular order you need to follow when writing a food chain. First and foremost, the first box or first link is always going to be a producer. Producers don't depend on other organisms to get their nutrients, so you can put them at the base or put them in the front. Next, following the producer, remember it's the energy transfer going from the producers to an organism. So who eats the plants? The herbivore. So the second link in your chain is going to be some sort of an herbivore. And then the energy from an herbivore is going to flow into a carnivore. And then usually the very last link in the chain, no matter how long the chain is, is going to be a decomposer. So let's take a look at an example of a food chain in this food web. So first of all, we're going to start off with the producer. So I'm going to start with seeds. So this is going to be our first producer. Now the energy from seeds flows into the chipmunk. So the chipmunk is going to be our herbivore. And then the energy in the chipmunk flows to the red-tailed hawk. That's going to be my carnivore. And then when the red-tailed hawk dies, the last link in the chain should always be a decomposer. So we can write fungus at the end because that's what's being represented here. So it's one example of a food chain. Another example of a food chain would include, let's do the berries and flowers. We want to start off with your producer, so that's our producer, the berries and flowers. And we have a couple of ways that we can go, but I'm going to go to the deer. The energy from the berries and flowers goes to the deer, so that's going to be our herbivore, the second link in the chain. And then the energy from the deer goes into the bear. That's our third link in the chain. And as always, the last link in the chain should go down to the decomposer there. Fungus should be the last link. So those are two food chains that you can pick out of this food web, and there are a few others that you can use. So that's how you find a food chain in a food web. Now let's go on to our last representation. Our last energy representation is called an energy pyramid. So as you can see, 
it's wide at the bottom like a pyramid and then it gets narrow at the top. And the reason why it's shaped like this is because an energy pyramid shows the amount of energy at each feeding level. Down here at the bottom, we have our producers, which have the widest area. That's going to be the area with most energy. And then we're going to go to the herbivores. And then we're going to go to the carnivores at the top here. As you can tell, the box gets smaller and smaller as you move up. Producers have the most energy, so they're at the bottom of the pyramid. And as you move up the pyramid, energy is lost. When energy is lost, the amount of energy decreases as you go to the top of the pyramid. The reason why energy is lost is this. All living things use energy to carry out life functions. Plants use energy. They need to grow. They need to develop. They need to carry out cell activities. So the rule of thumb is about 90% of the energy is lost per level. So let's do a little bit of math and look at that. So we're going to start off with a nice even number of 1,000 calories. Calories is usually the unit of energy that we use when we talk about energy use. So because the plant's growing, carrying out cell activities, 90% of the energy that it has is going to be lost. But 900 calories are gone. Well, if 900 calories are gone from the start of 1,000, that means when an herbivore eats a plant, they're only going to get 100 calories. Animals carry out body functions. Their heart needs to beat. They need to breathe. Their stomach needs to digest. They're running around, walking around. They're doing all sorts of things, so they're using up energy as well. So 90% of their energy is going to be lost into the atmosphere. They lose it as heat, and that's why we're warm all the time because our body's using heat. So we're going to lose 90 calories of energy. Or these animals will lose 90 calories of energy. So as a result, when the carnivores get to them, the carnivores are only going to get 10 calories of energy. So as we can see, as our organisms carry out life functions, they use energy all the time, and that's why each feeding level gets lower and lower in energy. So being at the top of the food chain is great. However, you also get the least amount of energy when you're doing that. So that's how an energy pyramid works. The amount of energy in an area really does have an impact on how many organisms can live in an area. And that's what we're going to talk about last. Okay, there's two terms that you should know. Limiting factors and carrying capacity. Limiting factors is any need that limits the number of individuals in a population. Sounds a little wordy, but maybe this will clear it up a little bit. Limiting factors include food, water, and living space. So the reason why they're called limiting factors is because the amount of food in an area can only support so many animals. If you have enough food to support 10 deer in an area, then the food is limiting the amount of deer that it can support. Only 10 can live there. If there's enough living space to house 40 rabbits, you can't fit 50 in there. So the living space is limiting the rabbit population to 40. As a result, what happens is because of these limiting factors in their presence, they determine what's called the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is the maximum amount of animals that can be supported by the limiting factors. If, in fact, the food here can support 10 deer, then the carrying capacity, or the most amount of deer that can live in an area, is 10. Let's go visit our friends in explaining how carrying capacity and limiting factors work. Hey there, Jerry. What's going on, Harold? What can I do for you? I was wondering what is the lake's carrying capacity? What is carrying capacity? Listen carefully, Grasshopper. Carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals that an area can support. How many hippos are supported by the their puddle of fun? I get it. The carrying capacity of that lake is 25 hippos. 25 hippos? That lake is huge. You could fit like 100 hippos in that lake. Well, our lake has limiting factors, Jerry. These limiting factors you speak of, what are they? Limiting factors are environmental things limit the amount of animals living in an area. What? Okay, limiting factors include food, water and space. There is only enough food to feed 25 hippos. So what you are saying is that if a group of 10 hippos decided to splish splash in your puddle of fun, there would not be enough food for everyone. Yes sir. The amount of food limits the population size to 25 hippos making it a limiting factor. 
Oh, then the limiting factor creates the carrying capacity. Since food is only limited for 25 hippos that means the maximum carrying capacity is 25 hippos. You know what? You are right. Huzzah! I hope you enjoyed that little cartoon. That's going to conclude our vodcast on energy transfers in an ecosystem and the effects on the population size it has. Have a great night, boys and girls.